Not long ago, a famous physician was asked, at what period in life does the aging process begin in the human being? And the doctor replied very quickly, the day of birth. And this is essentially true. And uh, it means that the process of life control has to begin early. And failure to get a good beginning is likely to result in a complicated termination. Not long ago, we also had another side of this problem. A lady wrote in. She was in her late 80s, and she wanted a five-year subscription to our journal, beginning now. She had the right attitude. It is the individual who is looking constantly toward the future, who has the best chance of extending life uh, to its maximum possible degree. Also, it is necessary to develop early a philosophy of life. Life has to be planned. And to plan life means that we have to develop a working philosophy that not only takes care of us through the various years of youth and maturity, but which prepares us to face retirement and later problems with peace and security and optimism. We have to find our place in the universal plan of things if we are really going to have a successful and purposeful life. To drift along from year to year, to live only for the moment, to have no broad plan is as dangerous to our moral lives as lack of financial planning is detrimental to our economic security. Security rests in a long-range pattern, a plan that we develop at a comparatively young age, mature, develop, unfold, enrich as we go along, which prepares us for a useful existence, but also prepares us for those changes which are part of the universal plan. All things in nature work together for good, and the life of the human being is a life intended to be a success. And it is only when we make failures out of it by our own misunderstandings that lives are wasted or the natural maturing of life is delayed or impaired. So we start in by trying to decide what we are going to do with a span of years that is actually our prime asset. It is that which gives us the opportunity and the privilege to become significant persons. All of the different steps of life must make sense in themselves and work together for a common end. Obviously, when we are very young, we may not know our intention. We may not understand our responsibilities and potentials. But at this stage, we have great dependence upon parental leadership. And the uh, successful life begins, if possible, with strong parental guidance in those years of formation. It is important to the person that the beginnings of life are associated with a good philosophy for living, and that the young person has the proper example from the elders around him and also from the society to which he belongs. As it is usually difficult to condition society, it becomes ever more important that family, home, and home circle should be as secure and meaningful as possible. Obviously, we have to begin our material existence with a certain degree of physical ignorance. We are not prepared for the changes that the years will bring. We are not prepared for social change and the change of environment and world customs and patterns and policies. 
but we are capable from within ourselves of adjusting to that which is new or relinquishing that which is old with a good grace. We can make these adjustments. It all rests in ourselves. One of the earliest problems that we all face is education. And this problem becomes more acute every day. This particular generation in which we now live suffers rather severely from over-education. We are over-schooled and not over-intelligent. We are not given the type of training that prepares us for a civilization or citizenship. Therefore, schooling for most is going to be a rather dismal experience. It is going to be too pressureful, too intense, and too highly organized to give the individual the proper background for personal living. But it is necessary to accept some type of the educational pattern in order to prepare for adjustment in society. But the educational adjustment, like every other adjustment of life, must be impelled by something above an economic pattern. The individual who lives and dies simply in terms of economics also frustrates the purpose for himself. We are not here to be wealthy. We are not here to dominate other people. We are here to be useful to ourselves and those around us. We are entitled to a reasonable reward for our endeavors, and if our earnings justify, we are entitled to a secure economic pattern. But we should never build our lives on the success formula alone. We should never hope that we are going to achieve pleasure, comfort, happiness, or security on an economic level alone. One of our problems today is the loss of overtones, the loss of those ideals and principles which ensoul labor, which dignify effort and give purpose to existence. Always in our daily living, there must be some motivations, some dreams, some aspirations, which bring out from within ourselves a higher level of personal intelligence than that which comes from economic adjustments alone. So we have to build something which we might say the ensouling of a pattern. Our physical lives are very much like physical bodies. They are instruments and vehicles. As the body without the soul is an inert mass, so society without a soul is doomed to disaster and sorrow. Every concept, every belief, every policy of life must be ensouled by principles. There must be a dream behind every career, a hope behind every action, and a sincere desire to help behind the whole pattern of our careers in this world. So we try to think in terms of giving meaning to skills and knowledge, dedications to the various activities with which we are involved. As we go along through the busy and summit years of our living, we are already involved in processes of adjustment. And among the most important of these uh, periods of adjustment for many persons is the problem of economic adjustment, a, an adjustment to a future which is involved in a retirement program. The individual generally thinks of retirement as release from the burden of economic pressures and responsibilities. Many persons who retire have de de resolved and dedicated within themselves the conviction that from that point on they are not going to do anything. It is going to be one unbroken rest. And this unbroken rest becomes a kind of sleep that is burdened with numerous nightmares. The last thing the individual can safely look forward to is excessive leisure. 
if he looks forward to, to freedom from all responsibility and effort, and considers that having made his contribution to his world, he is now entitled uh, to relax indefinitely and drift along without any major purpose or project, and that this is a reward for a life of labor. He is wrong, very wrong and will be in trouble from the time this conviction takes over. No individual in this world can ever be happy unless he knows how to use leisure time. Leisure in the busy years of life is at a premium, but as the individual approaches the end of a business or economic career, leisure looms large. And I know a number of persons today who are struggling with the problems of leisure. They do not know how to rest without simply going into a kind of premature age. Leisure to them simply means to sit around, play cards, gossip with their friends, take occasional trips here or there, and for the most part, do nothing. Others, with a little more ingenuity, decide that this is a good period to catch up with a long hoped for time of reading. Many individuals firmly believe that as soon as they are free from the burdens of business, they are going to become students of life. Some do. But after a little time, this also begins to fade out. It is not enough to really attract the total person. Another solution, of course, is to drift into perpetual television programs. This, however, gradually becomes an obnoxious situation. No one can spend the closing years of a busy life glued to a television set. Yet for so many, there is no plan. There is no project. It just drifts. Uh, this drifting is largely modified by external circumstances. The individual follows a line of least resistance and does what seems to be next and pays no attention to any general program or purpose. This is in itself, of course, a waste of life. For a person to labor hard and industriously for 40 years, and then do nothing with what he has learned except to hope to forget it, is not a consummation greatly to be desired. It is far more important to begin to contemplate the consequences of these years of experience and adjustments which we've had to make. Now, through the years, of course, we bring a whole group of personalities each one with different, different emphasis, each one with a different attitude towards experience. Some people from the day of their first job are badly adjusted. They resent work. To them, the end of work is the end of trouble. And when they can finally close the door on the last job that they hold, this is a reward. But this is because they were poorly adjusted in the first place. They did not make proper use of the years in which employment could have been informative, educational, or a challenge to the release of internal potentials. Another problem that we have to face is that most people do not realize that they have potentials. They go to school, perhaps they become involved in some trade, craft, or profession, and they settle down to it it never occurs to them to consider the total person, that there is within each of us something, sometimes many different things, waiting to express themselves, waiting to unfold and grow and inspire and direct conduct. Unless we make some use of internal potential, we die with the same soul power locked in us with which we were born. Nothing has happened inside except this gradual, we might say, adjustment, a rather pathetic type of adjustment to the inevitables of external existence. If we are really going to 
amount to something as far as our own lives are concerned, we have to begin to consider potential. And to most folks today, potential is in the form of avocational activity. Once having become set in a business or profession or trade, which requires a large part of our stamina, we do not feel like we can carry several jobs at one time. So we generally develop some type of avocational interest an avocational interest that we justify because we feel that it is contributing in some way to our well-being. Such avocational interests sometimes involve sports, sometimes it impels us to study some art or trade or craft in spare time. Sometimes it turns into a love of gardening or a love of travel or the desire to hike along desert roads. We have all kinds of avocational activities, which for the most part we exercise because we feel that they contribute some way to a balanced life, that they get us away from the pressure of things, which if we did not have these breaks would become more than we can take. But many times these avocational interests are very little better than a waste of time themselves. The individual is in attempting to escape the routine and monotony of his job also seeks to escape from himself. He tries to get away from the challenge of his own internal life. He does nothing to enrich his outer existence by calling upon inner resource. He just drifts from one type of external adjustment to another. This is not enough to give him the type of life uh, that is valuable as he gets older. He is going to reach maturity and retirement age living only on the surface of himself. He is going to live almost completely dependent upon environment and with little or no control of his own life. He is going to drift from one um, comparatively unimportant activity to another. And the importance locked within himself is never going to get a chance to express. He is just going to continue to live on the surface of his own mind, on the surface of his own emotions, and on the surface of his own physical career. It is wise then to try to be, be realize that by looking around us today, we see the tragedy of surface living. We see how inadequate it is to have no depth dimension in our own consciousness. We are not able to call upon internal strength when need arises. Therefore, we depend more and more upon economic security. We depend more and more upon the political world around us to protect our interests. The individual does not protect the, only, the primary interests of his own life. And these interests are all of them involved in personal growth not in adjustment to an economic situation. Economics there must be, but it, the economic survival is unimportant unless there is something in the individual that is important enough to require, demand, and justify survival. Without these inner purposes, the continuance of physical existence is little more than a tragic monotony. So as we go along, we also begin to look for something, sometimes we call it a religion, sometimes we call it a philosophy of life, sometimes it is little better than a series of personal convictions based upon experience. Now personal convictions can be very important, and experience is important, if the convictions and the experience are valid. Too often, however, personal experience is so highly involved in personal attitudes that the individual is defending his mistakes and using experience to justify his own weaknesses unless he is wise enough to rise above this possibility. The, the development of a philosophy of life which is based entirely upon self-justification doesn't get us very far. We often are much worse off because of it. Any life that is embittered because personal unhappiness has occurred 
has failed to make use of experience. But out of this embitterment develops a negative philosophy of life which perpetuates the embitterment itself and applies it to new situations where it should not be involved. Therefore, it is usually wisest for the individual to develop an interest in some system of thought that has stood the test of time. Some belief, some philosophy, some ethical code, some moral structure that has not developed entirely within himself, but for which he feels internal need. Thus, uh, many uh, persons have found, as they get older, an increasing need for religious insight. They want some form of spiritual security. They want to have certain faith in themselves and in the world in which they live. Young people create or try to create lives of their own. Older persons depend very largely upon faith, the realization or belief in values which are beyond and above the commonplace and everyday experiences. Faith in something more important than ourselves is essential to a mature life. No individual is so completely self-sufficient uh, that he can fail to make an adjustment with that which is superior to himself. The completely self-sufficient person is usually in serious trouble and often becomes a negative factor in family and social life. Having come to the realization that we need something that is going to steady and balance our personal conduct, we have all kinds of possibilities. We have several great systems of ethics in the world. We have several great religions, which in one way or another can be serviceable. Then comes the problem of trying to adjust to one of these. In early life, most people are rebels. They are rebels against family, against home, against the world in many cases. And the more adolescent they are, the more intense the rebellion. It requires some time, therefore, for the individual to outgrow his resentments against things he does not approve of. These resentments are some of them rather well justified, but in other instances they are simply personal pressures of likes and dislikes taking over control of a life, where such is the case uh, the life itself is seriously damaged. Sometime, usually in early middle life, often when children arise, uh, the problem of an ethical system or a moral spiritual code uh, begins to intrude itself. Most persons would like to have their children grow up with good principles, uh, high morals, proper ethics, and with a certain amount of cultural gentility. Uh, most parents today are being disappointed in this area because of the lack of planning either in the family or in society for the directing of the activities of the child or young person's temperament. So uh, the search for some type of spiritual directive comes in. Many individuals find this directive by simply going back to the faiths of their fathers, faiths which to some others might seem rather shallow. But if they meet the need of the person, if they give that person a legitimate reason for existence, if they give that person the courage to meet the day with a better attitude, then that particular belief is suitable to that person. I think it is always a mistake to discredit the faiths and beliefs of other people, so long as these faiths and beliefs are ethically sound. This type of situation divides people into many groups, uh, some with better understanding, with deeper realization of experience, some who have grown a little more through the years of activity find the need for a deeper and more positive conviction. They want some answers to questions. They want to know more, and they want to have the right to discriminate. They want to allow the mind to censor their beliefs so that the mind tells them what is reasonable and what is not reasonable. 
In this particular procedure, however, the heart must also be involved. An intellectual religion is not always a comfort in time of trouble. There must also be a very definite emotional factor, something that gives faith and hope and love and kindness. There must be a veneration for the good. There must be a realization within the self of the magnitude of the universal plan to which we belong. The more, per, the more the individual advances, the further his thoughts develop, the less room he has in his life for negative religious attitudes or for systems of culture which threaten or disturb or demolish the natural optimism of the person. So the working with religion has as its final end that we gain a general conception of why we are here and where we are going. A religion must give us not only stability for now, but a proper attitude toward the future, an attitude which enables us to face the future with a good hope. This, again, is a matter to a large degree of faith. But gradually, faith, enriched by contemplation of personal experience, becomes so factual that it is seldom questioned. In fact, we have to accept nearly every important belief that we have, spiritual or materialistic, upon faith, because the final answers to the questions that we all ask can only be internally experienced. They cannot be classified and taught uh, to all human beings because each person has needs of their own and to these needs all faiths are adjusted that's why throughout the world the great religions are very largely nationalistic or racial because they belong to times and places and to people with certain experiences of life and many of the generalities of these faiths are equally valid everywhere but some particulars some special doctrines seem to be largely purposed towards local conditions and periods of history. Having come gradually to the realization of the need for some type of internal culture, the person must then begin to consider what this is going to cost. Not so much in terms of money, because he can borrow the books from the library or talk with his friends, it isn't necessarily a financial problem, but it is an adjustment problem. The individual, in order to gain anything from knowledge, must live according to what he learns. And this is a challenge that many are not able to accept. The result is that there are great numbers of persons who have acknowledged very enlightened systems of religion, moral and eth morality and ethics, but have never been able to live them. The uh, fact that the person accepts a faith does not mean that their disposition is markedly changed. It does not mean that they overcome negative habits, nor does it mean that they are better adjusted with their friends, families, and society. Great many believers have never been able to apply their belief. For this reason, a kind of new believing has come into focus. And that is salvation by the acknowledgement of values. The individual says, I believe in honor. I believe in honesty. If he makes this formal statement, this is the basis of his salvation. The practice of the honesty does not come into the picture. This means that many persons claim strong religious allegiances who have never lived according to the things they claim to believe. The greatest, of course, of this pattern that we recognize is the Christian problem of the fact that nearly all Christians accept the divine importance of the Sermon on the Mount, but very few people succeed in living it. Most persons uh, find need of correction in the lives of others, but leave their own lives uncorrected. We're building, however, along a line of thoughtfulness. We come toward those years where what we have done inside uh, begins to be very important on the outside. 
If we have built a reasonably good philosophy of life, if we have solved certain dilemmas of our own thinking, if we have made reasonable corrections of excessive faults of our own, we can come gradually into the mature years, years of contemplation and thoughtfulness uh, with a well-balanced internal life. We are not any longer subject to the tempests and torrents of attitudes which have afflicted us perhaps in younger days. We are smoothing out. Now, smoothing out, in the case of the individual, has many values. One of the most common values of the soothing process is health. The individual who conserves his energies and his resources has a greater probability of protecting and preserving health for a maximum period of time. The individual who is constantly emotionally stressed, who is unable to adjust to the daily problems of life but carries into his older years an eternal fretfulness, is less likely to enjoy a retirement or to maintain friendships and comradeships along the way. More important than this, however, is that it is the quiet, well-ordered life that makes the greatest demand upon internal resource. The person who has quieted down the pressures and excesses of attitudes and emotions in this quietude has a direct contact with himself. The individual who has gotten out of his own way is therefore in a condition to release the greatest amount of his own internal content. The quiet person is more or less in constant meditation. He is in a condition to respond to inner ideals with practically no external interference. If there are extrasensory faculties uh, suitable to be adjusted at that time, the person becomes aware of them. He finds that he is able to call upon his own spiritual resources, that he is also able to understand what he never understood before. Because the natural point in the philosophy is that the older years are years of wisdom. And anyone who is not able to come into these years wiser than he was earlier in life has simply neglected self-culture. And uh, even then, it is possible sometimes to remedy or correct the situation by using the older years to enrich and ennoble uh, the way of life that we know and understand. So uh, the quiet life is the life which gives us the greatest potential for adjustment to eternal realities. The less of ourselves there is in our way of life the more of the divine well may come through and be part of our daily experience. Now this is not mental laziness. It is not the individual who has no thoughts or is completely unaware of his own internal. It is rather a quietude and an increasing dependence upon those ideals, philosophical truths and religious convictions that have been instilled in earlier years. Now, as we go along on this particular process, there are a lot of other factors that have to be taken into at least passing consideration. The one thing that we must all realize is that what the average person really wants to accumulate wealth for is in order to have freedom to do what he pleases. And therefore, if he is wealthy without internal maturity, he pleases to do a great many foolish things. He is not able to control the reward of his own wealth. He has the means, but lacking the integrities, finds the wealth a very heavy burden on him. As Buddha so well pointed out, wealth is the heaviest burden that the flesh must bear. And while most people would be very willing to carry the load, they are not so happy after they get it. Therefore, wealth as a, a matter of itself, as a means of protecting older years, is necessary to a measure. 
but is not a solution to anything. An individual can point out the fact that he is financially independent for the rest of his life and still live a completely worthless existence. Because the independence is nothing unless he has something in himself to use independence for. Some dedication that previously he has been unable to fulfill. But now with financial freedom and leisure, he can do those things which are important. If he has no sense of importance, then the retirement period is going to be a heavy burden on him or a cause of endless restlessness. I know people who are in retirement, and uh, we have them on our mailing list, some of them. And these people change address sometimes three or four times a year. Not because they have to, but because they get tired of where they are. They want some other change, something else to think about. And the only thing they can think about, some of them, is a change of address. Now this moves in on people. They don't think of it in this way. And yet it, uh, it comes finally to these conditions, these situations. So as we go along, let us never for a moment uh, plan or look forward to a retirement that is going to be insignificant. Uh, many persons become so bored and so wearied with the job they have that it seems to them that retirement is going to be a blessed state. Yet very shortly thereafter, the problems begin to develop. Uh, years ago, when many of our generation were thinking these things through, it was assumed by insurance and actuarial groups that the average person retiring would not live more than five years after retirement. They, they would not live longer because the incentives for life would be taken away. Boredom would set in. There would be no call upon the person to do important things, no fulfillments of anything except a desperate effort to waste his own time. And this becomes unendurable. So against this type of pattern, there is the person who finds that to keep young, to keep healthy, to have a significant period of years ahead, there must be a constructive, purposeful program. And, not, and all incidental forms of time killing gradually kill the individual. He knows before he makes these foolish moves that they are not important. He knows that he is killing time. He is wasting the precious opportunities to complete or unfold the purposes of his own life. It is much better for him, therefore, to consider an immediate adjustment to some purpose that is worthwhile and useful to him. Now, of course, there are some individuals who, uh, whose health problems limit activities. Some are not able to continue indefinitely. But where this is true, then there can be various internal forms of significant activity. The individual can continue to grow in spite of the fact that there may be limitations upon his physical activities. The first thing we have to think about then, probably, is to find out, if we possibly can, what there is inside of ourselves, the development of which would be most meaningful. Also, what line of research in our own characters would give us the greatest faith with which to live for the future? What can we do to take away from ourselves all blank ends, all dead projects, everything that is not meaningful. Some find new careers, and these folks generally do quite well. I know several careers that have been built up by the simple fact that the person continued to recognize social responsibility and that retirement from job does not mean that the individual has fulfilled his social obligations. 
that the individual is responsible for his contributions to society to the last day of his life. Several people that I know of have made actual and interesting side activities. Some have done research projects in fields of interest. One that I know or knew for many years after retirement took up botany and became an authority on medical herbs and things of this nature and finally wrote an important book on the subject. This person kept on trying to be of service to society and found a program that was probably more intensive than they had worked during their working years, but a program to which they gave their heart and soul and for which they uh, gained a good reputation and a realization of contribution to society. Another individual might go in a different direction, but as long as the individual lives, he must to be useful or he will ultimately hate himself. This uh, problem of being useful is often a matter of opportunity. The place where we are, the things that are happening around us, become the base, basis of useful contributions. There are many projects to which individuals can associate themselves. There are various enterprises, charitable, educational, cultural, that ask for help, that need people to do things, not necessarily just to give money, but to help to make a project succeed by personal time and through personal dedication. And if a person who is retired from business commits themselves to some type of a regular program of giving a number of days or a number of hours to a project in each week, we'll find that this particular procedure lengthens life and increases the sense of personal integrity. Wherever there's nothing pressing, we must press on to find something. If he does not, he is going to damage his own state of future life. Now, I've known a number of persons who, under the pressure of retirement or under the pressure of fatigue, which has been associated with retirement, have done very foolish things. They have decided that they are too tired to do anything. Now, it's true that you can prove to your own satisfaction that a long career of 30 or 40 years in the business world is enough to fatigue anybody. And this particular type of fatigue is very common with school teachers who have had a long career working with difficult children and feel that they have done their duty as far as society is concerned. They want no more of it. But no matter how many years of service the person has given, it's not that possible. In fact, it is more difficult because of years of regular service to suddenly discontinue such activities. The individual must not, under any condition, draw a line and say, my active life ends here. This is especially true while the active life is still in good shape and really is only lacking incentives. Much fatigue is plain boredom, and there's no form of boredom that is worse than being bored with yourself. And the individual who is otherwise in good health able to do what he pleases, and very often does, in some fields at least, have his own actual activities. The idea that the person is too tired or too old or too infirm to go on and do things is more or less ridiculous. The actually, the more bored we become, the less we want to do, and the more we do, the less bored we are. So if the uh, fatigue is not traceable to a distinct and definite ailment, it should not be given much consideration. And if there is an ailment, every effort should be made to correct that, and in that way rescue the life from this pseudo-fatigue mechanism. The person must realize that perhaps the retirement or gradually verging towards independence is a penalty. It is not. It is an opportunity for the individual to perform a variety of personal accomplishments 
which have been relatively impossible in the past. So what we are going to do now with this problem that uh, retirement is imminent, that the person has now reached that period in life in which his children are on their own, his business responsibilities are largely over, and uh, the problem of facing futures becomes significant. What kind of futures do we face? The average person who retires today has very good probabilities of at least 15 years of useful life, often more. And uh, it's not unusual to find an individual active and busy and doing things 25 years after retirement. With this type of situation, we really have a time for a complete career. We have time for the individual to build a new life and have an opportunity to fulfill this life in many respects and to have the successes perhaps in this life that never came to them in the long years of their routine existence. I know a number of individuals who have won international awards, who have become leaders in the arts, crafts, and philosophies and sciences, who have been highly rewarded and have been recognized long after the retirement from their ordinary jobs. They had the opportunities to then develop and accomplish a, a completely new career. It is also noticeable that sometimes the individual retiring goes for two, three, four, five years in a state of doldrums. He doesn't know what he wants to do. He is bored. He is uh, wasting time. He is do devoting the precious time, which is our human allotment, uh, to useless, meaningless pursuits. He's just sitting around in a state of semi-coma, not doing or pressing any purpose that is worthwhile. After a while, however, one of two things happens. Either this attitude runs the person down to the point where they can't do anything, or it wakes them up to the point where they become absolutely irritated with themselves. They decide the time has come to stand up and do something. These people then begin to develop faculties, powers, and attributes that are important. The moment an individual feels his life to be important, he begins to take more interest in his own health. And the individual who is simply waiting to fade out doesn't pay much attention to his health. He doesn't care. But when he knows that there is something he wants to do and that health can interfere if he is not well, he then begins to take care of himself. He makes corrections in his own way of life. He improves his diet. He develops certain t attitudes that are constructive. And most of all, he gets a new mental point of view. It is a very great mistake that but many people do make, and that is to st start by dying first in the mind. Not that they become feeble, but they become p p uh, purposeless. They do not use the mind as a leader of the life. They simply drift along, allowing things to happen. When they get a little angry with the fact that things do not happen, or nothing much is accomplished, then they start in taking on new activities, new projects, and new dimensions of experience. Very often, this type of thing can lead to new jobs, uh, part-time employment, which may be all they need. But it also gives an opportunity for the development of a non-commercial career. If the person has a pension, has retirement funds, or has at least a considerable part of their future protected so that only minor other needs are essential, then the person can live no longer to make a living but to build a life, no longer considering first of all economics, but considering first of all the fulfillment of those characteristics of the person which have been blocked by economics for the larger part of their business career. The, uh, the woman of the family has no longer the problem of her children. Uh, she is now a person with greater freedom and has the opportunity of going on in education. 
I attended a commencement, one of our colleges, not a long time, not so very many years ago, in which a man and his grandson graduated in the same class. The uh, desire for learning had always been there. I know another case where a man got his medical degree when he was 78 years old and practiced for 10 years and was very happy about the whole thing. It's to get behind ourselves with some kind of a project that really takes care of most of the problems. And those who do develop projects nearly always live to com complete those projects, or that is to achieve a degree of success in them that satisfies the life. To, to have something special to do seems to lengthen life. It seems also to give greater satisfaction to life. And it undoubtedly accomplishes this, at least in part, by improving the disposition. An individual whose disposition goes to weed is nearly always subject to more ailments than those who have a constructive mental attitude. One of the best of all constructive mental attitudes is to forget yourself entirely by doing something that is more important than yourself. The individual who is living only to satisfy himself has much more danger of infirmity than the person who says, I haven't time to think about myself. The job must be done. And uh, many cases, individuals who have been considered in the last stages of terminal illness have survived one, two, three, or four years longer than it was believed to be possible simply because they had to finish the job before they could go. And this is the best way to go when the time comes, is to be there working at the job. In our field of activity, working at the job has many interesting possibilities. It is true that we must, to a measure at least, live with ourselves. And there is a grave probability that when we leave here, we still live with ourselves, which is one of the things we have to give a little attention to. Most people who have been able to make better adjustments with life have accepted the immortality of the human soul. They have realized firmly and deeply that th this life is not the end of their existence. And the belief that consciousness, intelligence, and individuality survive the grave, this belief has a tremendous moral effect upon people. If you can really make that stick inside yourself, if you can really maintain the solid conviction that the journey is not terminated here, and that the things that we learn here, the lessons that we achieve here, all of them are part of a continuing program of self-culture, that we are always in a program of continuing to learn, continuing to grow. This helps a tremendous amount because it takes away forever the termination of anything. It takes away from us the feeling that our little life is truly rounded by a sleep. We know if we think a minute about the universe and its development and its progress that it is inconceivable that any plan by means of which this vast cosmic system could come into existence with all its creatures and all its creations, that such a plan could end in oblivion, that the power that fashions this particular universe to which we belong has it as, as its final termination to put all these chess men back in the box and close it. This type of thinking is very bad for people who want to have good older years. It is much more important for the person to look forward to the fact that life is forever changing, but that life is eternal. Under those conditions, people can start projects without even worrying about whether to finish them or not. It's way possible that someone who takes up wood carving at 60 or 65 is not going to be able to become an El Greco, but he can start. I had an old friend who started learning Spanish when he was in his 70s. He said he didn't think he'd live to learn it very well, but it would help him next time. 
So whatever it is, it is the looking forward that does the trick. It is the looking forward that ends forever this note of pessimism. It also ends for every individual the fear of change, the fear of the fact that all he has will be spent by his relatives after he's gone, or that perhaps his immortality will consist of being able to sit on the side of the coffin and watch them spend it, which, is a, which would be a very sad experience. But this is only natural to a person who overvalued it in the first place. He should have known before he began that he couldn't keep it. He should have used what he could as wisely as he could, but never believed, and never believed that the bank account was going to be of any permanent value beyond the amount it helped him to grow or helped him to help other people. These thoughts become basic. But with a future that goes on and on, there is every reason to keep on trying just as long as possible. A person may live to 65 years with a very bad disposition, an incurable temper, and a very unpleasant lack of social adjustment. If, however, at 65 he begins to reform, if he changes his ways, if he becomes more thoughtful and controls himself, he'll be getting a start for a better disposition in the future. And it is a strange thing that very often repentances accompany age. The individual who was really worthless in his life repents in his closing hours and perhaps receives the blessings of his faith before he departs. But this repentance may have some value. He repented only because he was afraid. He repented only because he probably had too long a time in his illness to remember his own mistakes. He may have repented because he wasn't sure that his previous materialism or sophistication was going to be much further use to him. But in repentance, whatever it may be, if it is a sincere recognition of a mistake, and a really sincere and devout determination to one way or another correct this condition if possibility exists, it may mean that he carries forward into the future a resolution to live better than he did while he was here. In fact, the repentance may be the proof that he has recognized his own mistake. So taking away from the individual the termination of his own experiences, taking away from him the idea that all that he has tried to do, all he has tried to be, is going to be forgotten, uh, that he is going never to know again or that he even exists. This type of philosophy is socially a tragedy. Materialism is not only a detriment to the individual, but the most positive detriment to human society. The uh, nation, the individual, the race, the culture that does not believe in uh, the ideals and principles and integrities uh, of endurance and going on and improving. This type of society will breed nothing but anarchy and despair. So the person for his own good and society must be built upon a foundation of dedicated integrities dedicated to the improvement of self and the improvement of the community and the world at large. Now, it sometimes happens that older people may, must make decisions about their lives. And these decisions, of course, differ very largely with circumstances. But all things being equal, the better disposition the older person had in his younger years the more comfort and happiness he's going to find in the decisions he must later make. Some of the most uh, important decisions involve helping other people. It is simply um, as a tragedy that older people are not useful in the very environments where they have lived, where they are actually of great value to their families and to the communities in which they exist. 
I know several families in which the elders are the strongest, most positive, and productive members of the family, that they are the ones that are holding the whole thing together. They have the solid values, and when emergencies arise, the younger people turn to them as the rocks of ages, something they can depend on. They may, in their younger years, these younger people may have very little thought for this problem, but as they get a little older themselves and begin to recognize the responsibilities of living, a good relationship between themselves and their older relatives become, become important. But this is frustrating if the older person is impossible. And this is what happens when they do nothing to make themselves possible. Some cantankerous elder can be a danger and a detriment to any family. But a dedicated one who loves their children or loves their grandchildren and finds joy and fulfillment in service can have a wonderful life. It all depends upon the person. Then there are some who have looked forward for all their years to being alone. They wanted to be by themselves. Well, this isn't as successful a pattern as might be suspected either, because when you live only by yourself, you have no one to live with but yourself, and it is often a very serious disaster. The people who cannot get along with others can seldom get along with themselves. They therefore become subject to all kinds of neurotic tendencies. They become more and more antisocial. Uh, they become more difficult to live with. And even in a retirement community, they are a menace. N nothing works well if the individual does not want to be a part of his world and continue to serve it as long as he possibly can. So by making certain changes in your own way of life, as you go along, uh, you can make a very major uh, improvement in the important years, which should be the best years of your life. Actually, the idea of heaven is more or less a place in which you have an opportunity to enjoy the rewards of a good life whether you are protected against the dangers that beset the worldly and where all people go on blissfully together to eternity. Well, there is a short prologue to heaven in the older years of each person if he wants to do something about it. He can begin to have this peace of mind, peace of soul. He can have the rewards of labor. He can have the joy and happiness and friendship and affection of those whom he has served, and he can settle down to a long period that perhaps will be more successful in heaven, and maybe the only heaven he's going to have anyway. But regardless of this, he can do something important with it. It all depends upon getting started and uh, making something of it. Now, if the person reaches retirement with none of these adjustments, the shock may be produce some very valuable changes. He may gradually discover that the things that he thought he was going to want to do have no real interest for him. He may discover that all this leisure is really killing him, that he simply cannot fritter away 20 years doing nothing that means anything to himself or anybody else just because he thinks he's tired. The more time he wastes, the more tired he will be. And gradually he will make himself into a non-productive creature. He will finally exhaust all interest in everything. When these points of retirement come then, it's very important for the individual to make plans to make the future valuable to himself. And the only way he can do this is to get his mind more and more off of himself. As long as he says, I want to be happy, I want to do this, I must have that, he is going to remain a little miserable. Because actually, happiness is a byproduct. No one has ever succeeded in making themselves happy by a frontal effort. Happiness is a byproduct of service. It is a byproduct of dedication. 
it is a byproduct of self-forgetfulness in the service of something more important. Happiness comes to those who serve, not to those who search for happiness directly. Happiness does not come from security of the material things. It comes from a security within the self in which we live in a relationship of peace with our own inner lives. Without this type of happiness, the rest of the pattern is very ineffective. So we know that the happiness can be ours. And I know people that go out every day and try, and try to find out ways in which they can be of service to other people. I've known a number of very brilliant musicians who, after they retired from public career, simply went into religious charity. They accepted impoverished pupils who could not pay for lessons and gave them their time and effort and trained them in music. Music was what the person loved. Therefore, he shared it with those who otherwise couldn't have it. The one man I know who did that would certainly have been able to charge a hundred dollars a lesson because he was world famous violinist. Instead of that, he charged nothing. In many cases, bought cheap violins for his young pupils so they'd have something to play on. Another person who did this in very definite uh, situations did a great deal for this was uh, Chrysler, the violinist. All these people found ways to do things to help. And uh, Chrysler on one occasion listened to a little boy in the, uh, one of the ghettos of New York who was doing a, trying to play the violin and was doing a terrible job of it. And Chrysler sat there smiling and beaming and encouraging. And a friend said to him afterwards, he said, How did you do it? How could a man with your trained ear in music actually endure this particular program? Oh, he said it was very easy. I just remembered my own beginnings. <laughs> and the rest was very simple. And this is the way a great many people have found outlets for service. The uh, problem of care of children is becoming increasingly difficult now that in many families uh, the, both parents are employed. Plans and programs to work out protection for children can become an important factor among elder people. Group planning for a group guardianship of children while parents are working can be a very important and constructive contribution to society today. There are many, many ways in which the person looking for something to do can find things that are valuable. But the person who is looking carefully to avoid anything to do will never find any really useful activity. I know that with the present economic situation where a great many charities, a great many uh, national projects and welfare projects are apt to be curtailed, that there will be still greater opportunity for voluntary service in many fields which must otherwise be neglected. Here people who have training, who have dedication, can find the golden opportunities to keep on with the thing that they know best. That is work. We, anyone really worthwhile knows work probably better than any other activity in life. And uh, a good life and a long life depends on keeping on with the work. The world's work must be done. Younger people are not adequate. Younger people do not know what is necessary. But those who are now able to do these things have a tendency to retire annoyed and disillusioned. The time has come to try to put these things together again and make a, a pattern that is real and valuable. The uh, dignity of the older person has long been established in most countries. But to, in this country, and in much, much of Europe, and much of the world today for that matter, youth has taken over. Youth has tried desperately to create the changes that are probably many of them very sorely needed. 
But youth has not the experience, it has not the value sense to make these things possible. Therefore, a strong companionship or comradeship between the strength and enthusiasm of youth and the prudence and wisdom of age, from this combination, permanent improvement must develop. It cannot be done by a group that has not experienced the values and the needed things. And yet, for so many, the barrier between age and youth is partly at least responsible uh, for a slowing down of our cultural life. Many older people simply are not interested in continuing to fight for the things they believe. They are disillusioned also. And if the disillusioned youth mingle with the disillusioned elders, there is very little good going to be accomplished. It's time for somebody to break that vicious circle. And the individual who is despondent, critical, and fault-finding uh, will do well to reconsider. Actually, every day the world receives a new shock of some kind. And older people watching their televisions or listening to their radios or reading their newspapers become more and more disillusioned about the world in which they live. Most people who have looked forward from childhood to a better world for their children or for those who come after now question very seriously whether this better world is as, is as imminent as they might wish it to be. No time now for older people to be disillusioned. What we now generally accept as disillusionment should be a challenge. It should point out the more and more urgent need for the values that maturity can bestow. And older people are coming forward very, very rapidly and are becoming much more important in our world affairs because they alone represent the living wisdom of a people. Among the Iroquois tribes of American Indians, the older ones were the keepers of the Orenda. The Orenda was the wisdom, the intangible integrities, which are the foundation of survival. The elders were the ones who were the keepers of the records, who, were the st who had the stories of the old ones and the true ones who had the wisdom of the tribe, who had lived long, and traveled far. And the young came to them and were blessed with the wisdom. They were given the, ch the sacred message of the people. The Orenda was taught to the young. It was taught in the form of the hero legends, of the warriors who had given all and their lives and everything to take care of their tribe who had gone out and fought and died to save their women and children. These were the legends. These were what the young people were told. They were also told of the gods who helped them and protected them, and who gave them healing and gave them wisdom. And they were taught the secrets of government. And the government was the long house. And the government was the on the white robe of the peace. And the government was the wisdom of the ages and the temple of the, the wigwam or the great council hall was a replica of the great council hall in the sky up above where the olds and the trues and the elders guided forever. And everything was according to great laws and great principles. And government was an integrity and the young were taught these things. They were taught kindness and thoughtfulness and consideration. The young were taught that when they went out to hunt, they had no right to eat until the women and children were fed first. And if anyone had to go hungry, it was a mature man. These things were honor. Without this, there was no code. Also, in government, it was interesting. We talk now about matriarchal principles in connection with life. The great League of the Nations, which later inspired Wilson's League of Nations, was controlled by women. The women were never the senators that attended, but they were the electors of them. And every man who represented the people was elected by a woman. This was a very interesting thing. 
And it also meant that when they all sat in judgment or in, in law, it was the law of the Iroquois that no representative could cast a vote for his own party. He was never permitted uh, to participate in an election involving the tribe he represented. He must remain silent. Others must do this. When a matter was important, the, the one who was important, or thought it was important, uh, opened the door. He told the story of what he wanted, or what he thought was important. When he was finished, he sat down. Then the others all spoke, and none could contradict one another. No one could abuse, no one could downgrade, no one could accuse anyone of anything. Everything had to be done in peace. There was to be no competition. Only consideration was the good of all. And these were the wisdoms of the olds, the, the wisdom of the trues, the spirits who had gone before. And they were the basis of the moral code of the young who were taught these things. And the reason they could be taught, and here is the rub, the reason they could be taught is because the tribe had always lived them. It wasn't telling your son to be good after you had lived a desolate life. It was that you were to go on in the way of the past, of honor, integrity, well-being, honesty, virtue, unselfishness. These were the rules of the time. Now today, these rules are largely in the keeping of the older generation. The younger generation is not trying to keep the rules. They want to make new rules. Some of them will be good. We do not deny this. But the wisdom of the old is lost in our way of life. It is lost because we have not demanded recognition for it. It is lost because the elders themselves have forgotten the way. And they must find it again if they want to bring our world and our people into better perspective. Those who have retired from the struggle of life, those who are no longer forced to toady uh, to some um, adamant employer, those who have the freedom to live their lives and think their thoughts, dream their dreams, are the old who we call the elders, they are the ones who are free to make these decisions. They have nothing to lose, everything to gain. They are not forced to agree with what they do not believe. They do not have to vote for what they do not consider right. It is a matter where the older person, with perspective, freedom, and independence, can have a tremendous influence if his own life justifies it. But this is the thing that counts. And this is the reason why it is important for us all to prepare for these advancing years with a firm determination that when they come, we're going to use them for the common good. We're not going to sit back and rot out because we think we're tired. If we, are, if we think we're tired long enough, we're going to be really tired. But instead of that, we are going to stay with it as long as life remains, and what we can't do here, we will carry into the future when the proper moment arises. And in the course of time, all good things that we have come into this world to learn and through which uh, we grow and become better will be achieved in society. And the young and the old and the hell of strong and the weak will all combine to make this a better place to live. And if we can work on that basis, uh, we, we can do a lot with the years that we have, even though a few that went before have been wasted. We don't have to keep on wasting. So let every one of us, no matter of their age, young or old, roll up their sleeves and go to it. Thank you very much.